So good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to the final day of the uh, DOE PI meeting. And uh, this is the day that's devoted to breakout sessions for the working groups. And so you're here because you are interested in aerosol processes. Uh, so I will occasionally hope you're not uh, uh, too, too uh, I, mean, I just want to make you aware that I'll, I'll use APWG uh, instead of aerosol processes working group. There are a lot of acronyms in DOE, so I guess you've probably all figured that out. So you saw this slide in um, Allison's uh, presentation, but I just thought I would um, just sort of say sort of who, who we are, uh, just so you know. Um, you know, this is what the current status is, for example, of, uh, of the different uh, PI-led projects uh, in uh, ASR. And so um, what, what I did was uh, Shaima um, graciously uh, uh, allowed me to view uh, the current funded projects. And so I just kind of went down the list and I said, oh, that looks like a new particle formation study. That one looks like... Uh, Life cycle and properties is sort of a catch-all uh, of um, aerosol composition, mixing state, physical properties, removal, removal processes, and also just sort of, sort of general like holistic life cycle uh, kind of things like life cycle in different regions of the world, et cetera. So that's why it's, it's, the, it's the largest bin. Um, and then indirect and uh, direct radiative effects of optically absorbing aerosols. So the focus there is on optically absorbing aerosols. So black carbon, brown carbon. I'm not sure if there is a brown carbon project going on right now, but those kind of uh, issues about how composition and optical properties uh, relate, but also indirect uh, as well. And then it kind of, uh, uh, kind of meshes into maybe some cloud processes type proposals. And then finally, uh, the SOA group. Uh, there's a pretty sizable group of people uh, who are amongst us who are uh, working on understanding secondary organic aerosol formation and properties. Okay, so that's, uh, that's, that's it. Uh, that's uh, who we are, uh, at least who some of us are who are in attendance here. And so to, uh, the other thing I wanted to do is just to remind people uh, what some of the most recent, um, and then also what some of the uh, planned uh, arm field deployments are that have an aerosol processes component. And so I went down until I ran out of room on the page, so it ended with high scale, but of course, uh, you know, there's still a lot of analysis going on for, for campaigns such as Go Amazon, I suppose, um, and that would be probably the, the other one that fell off the list. Uh, but then just going up, the most recent uh, activities, I would say, the ones that are kind of coming up and that hopefully people are kind of thinking about are the Southeast U.S. deployment, uh, which we will hear uh, more about with Shanghai, the uh, sale campaign, which we'll hear more about from Dan. Uh, that's going to be uh, up in the high, uh, high altitude uh, mountains around Crested Butte. And then uh, Tracer, uh, and again, we'll hear also uh, from Chungai, who's going to represent, uh, there's, there wasn't a specific breakout on that, but we felt it was important enough that everyone in the working group should hear about uh, what the plans, current plans are for Tracer. So, and there was a recent uh, meeting uh, for Tracer, and so Chungai is going to report on that. And then, uh, and some very recent studies, Mosaic, of course, uh, and then, um, et cetera, if you just go down the list. And so, the, the main message here is that there's a lot going on that uh, in the in the way of field uh, um, deployments that that have overlap with the interests in our group and there are a lot of opportunities as well. Okay, so today's agenda is uh, shown here. Uh, we're going to try to do a lot, <laughs> just sort of like. Uh, it, the theme of, I guess, of this week has been to try to take advantage of the little time that we have together and, and try to accomplish as much as possible. Uh, we, like all of you, were kind of um, saddened by the fact that because of this format, we couldn't do posters anymore. And so we thought we would invite um, people to give really, really, really quick uh, summaries of the posters or, or they could actually talk about anything they want. So that's the impetus behind having this one minute madness, which is going to directly follow this introduction. 
Uh, and then we're going to have a presentation by John Schilling, who's, uh, a, who's what we call an, a translator uh, for aerosol processes working group. And so he doesn't translate aerosols. I would actually like him to do that for me, but uh, he, maybe it's above his pay grade. Uh, and then he's going to give us a little presentation about what that means and uh, whatever else he wants to talk about. And then we're going to go into uh, what's been sort of a tradition in this breakout, uh, just really quick summaries of uh, what, uh, you know, for those of you who couldn't make every single uh, breakout, what, what sort of some of the key takeaways were for the different uh, breakouts. And so that's going to be, you know, we, we selected those that we feel have a interest with the aerosol processes working group, and then tracers added there at the end, even though we didn't have a specific breakout. And then we've given ourselves about a half an hour or so for closing discussion. We have a few things planned. Uh, we're hoping that some things will just crop up that were unplanned. And so that's going to be today's agenda. Okay, so, uh, so, so the one minute madness begins. Uh, so uh, we'll see how it goes. <laughs> I say uh, the way, so what to, just to begin with, this is uh, sort of who we are uh, and, uh, and what, we, uh, what, what, what we put on our poster abstracts. Nicole put together this word cloud, uh, aerosol obviously being uh, the most important thing, I suppose. Uh, so the way this is going to work is that I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Um, I'm going to be the person who will call out uh, the the, peop the next person and uh, the first person to come up, and then the person that's on deck. On deck being the one that will come up following that. And I want everyone who is uh, going to present a one-minute poster to raise their hands right now. Good. Look at all those hands being raised. And that that does is that puts you on the top of our list. Okay. And so as we go through, uh, Nicole will be in charge of um, selecting uh, uh, the slide because we have control over the slides and also unmuting the speaker. And then I have my handy timer. And so I will be the timekeeper. You will hear a gentle uh, ring when your one minute is up. We're not going to be jerks about it, but we, we will be after maybe about 10 or 15 seconds. Well, I, I don't, uh, anyway. Uh, the one minute means that it's time for you to close the sentence that you were, you were uttering at that exact moment, okay? Um, anything else to say? Okay. So uh, we have uh, Aiken uh, coming up first. And then Nicole's going to put the slide up. And we have Burroughs on deck. I have Aiken, Burroughs, Cantrell, Kappa, Dubay. All right. Thank you so much, Nicole and Jim, for giving us the chance to do this. Um, this is a slide on a paper that's been accepted and is in press in ACP right now. Um, the first author is uh, my postdoc, Francesca Gallo. We've been looking at the aerosol observing system data at the ARM Eastern North Atlantic facility um, that's been known to be impacted by some local sources. And so we developed a mask and validated it with a supplementary site data set. And we did this using the CPC number concentration data. You can see a couple of plots, um, the Aiken mode and accumulation mode, and also the large accumulation mode. Um, essentially, the overall impacts are that if you're studying aerosol process studies, we highly recommend using a mask like this for especially when you're looking at the total submicron particles or the Aiken mode particles. It's possible if you're looking at accumulation mode or larger that the impacts are much, much smaller and that's what's shown in the bottom. Um, kind of it, or the bottom shows the number of total concentration. You'll have to check out the paper for the accumulation mode, otherwise you're taking my word for it. But anyways, um, this can be applied at other um, AOS locations, other ARM facilities, or other long-term or, or shorter-term, uh, high, you know, aerosol measurements. Thanks. Great. Thanks, Allison. Okay, sure. Burroughs, Cantrell on deck. So, yes, yeah, so this is a slide about a paper that we are uh, just 
about ready to submit, and it is focused on understanding the vertical transport of aerosols, specifically around the Southern Great Plains site. And this is part of my project focused on ice nucleating particles, where we have a portion focused at SGP. Um, and my postdoc, Gavin Cornwall, has been working on this. And so what we wanted to do here is because we're interested in IMPs and we know large particles are an important contributor is understand how they're transported turbulently vertically. So how much of them get exported to the free troposphere. And so we le leverage the lasso LES simulations to do this. And we find that when we resolve the boundary layer turbulence, we get a very different vertical structure um, using the LES. Then when we collapse that down to a single column and use parameterized boundary layer turbulence. So this is showing the, the real importance of boundary layer turbulence parameterizations for vertical particle transport. Thanks. And I can see that you had your own beeper. That was very good. Okay, Cantrell, Kappa on deck. This is the role of turbulent fluctuations in aerosol activation. The schematic on the top left shows the uh, distribution of relative humidity in the environment. The vertical bar is the critical supersaturation for an aerosol particle of a single size and a single uh, kappa value. And the punchline is if your uh, environmental supersaturation is much, much bigger than the aerosol, fluctuations play essentially no role at all in activation. Everything becomes a cloud droplet and that's shown in panel A. And that's, by the way, measured data from the pie chamber. On the other hand, if the environment is subsaturated relative to the aerosol particles, then the only way you can get activation is through fluctuations. And that's shown in panel C, where we have interstitials to the left of the dash line, and then the, the stuff to the right is droplets that have activated through these fluctuations. And then in the intermediate regime where the peak is greater than the aerosol, but not by much. You have this separation between the interstitials and the droplets. So to the left of the dash line and to the right of the dash line with the minimum in the middle. Um, I, as I said, all of these are for uh, 130 nanometer NACL. The data is for uh, from measurements in the pie chamber where we have a turbulent environment. And we have a paper coming out very shortly on this and have another one in preparation that we expect to be submitting within the next month or so. Thanks. Great. <clears throat> Thanks a lot. Okay. Uh, Kappa Dubay on deck. So we are interested in how water uptake influences light absorption by particles. So um, we've looked a lot in the past at how different types of components, such as SOA condensation on black carbon impacts absorption, but a lot less has been done uh, thinking about water uh, specifically and the, and the fact that water is uh, Hygroscopic and black carbon is not. So we are uh, we've we've developed a humidified uh, caps SSA system where we can actually characterize the absorption by particles under dry and humid conditions. And we're looking at a variety of different uh, mixtures and particle types in the lab. Uh, the bottom just shows some uh, early results from ammonium sulfate and fullerene sub mixtures, both internal and external mixtures. Uh, and the top is is some uh, early results looking at nigrosine. Uh, and we're going to um, go on to look at a, a variety of different systems, including more ground carbons, um, as well as the influence of photochemical aging uh, to understand how water uptake might or might not influence absorption. Great. Okay, Dubai, Hiranuma on okay. deck. Okay, great. Uh, we report here the analysis of the optical and chemical properties of the Woodbury fire smoke that was aged by about 12 hours that we observed at Los Alamos in June last year. Uh, the paper is led by Lee uh, et al, and it will be appearing soon in JGR. The plumes ranged from intact to more diverse uh, with uh, mixing with ambient air. Uh, on top, I show the conceptual models that uh, are the backbone of our analysis, which is that BC has a mass cross-section of nine meters per program in the blue and five in the red. Coded BC can enhance it uh, by a factor of two at most. Uh, and then we after the brown carbon uh, uh, mass absorption process. <laughs> in the middle, first figure one shows the results. I'm not showing you the data, but the analysis. And you can see that uh, this is the SP2 derived MAC. At the core of the plume, we have a MAC that's about two times greater than the BC MAC for in the red. Uh, uh, and in the blue, it's about five times uh, greater than the BC MAC. So this indicates both coatings and brown carbon play a role. Figure two shows a correlation between the 
MAC for BRC with the F, uh, the mass spectrometer derived Lebeguson factor. And you can see there's a nice correlation both for individuals within the plume and for plume averages. And there's a nice correlation, uh, sort of consistent with some past work, but uh, we've done both SPAMS and AMS analysis. So the mixing uh, state is being uh, treated pretty nicely. And the last point to make is this whole uh, idea of mixing across the plume. And you can see that at the edge of the plume, the max drop off and also as the F factor shows as a more aged aerosol. This is extremely important for models because uh, you know, the edges effects are ignored. And uh, while this numbers of max are ag agreeing with, with past estimates uh, used in models, we gotta treat the edge effects. So this is sort of an upper limit of MAC uh, that is being used in models. We're now on to tracer cat effects uh, that I think okay. Chang will talk about. Great, thanks Debe. Okay, Hiranuma and Hudson on deck. All right, thanks Jim. Um, so last year, October, I took portable ice nucleation experiment chamber, uh, pine chamber to SGP to do uh, 45 days straight of continuous ice nucleating particle measurement with eight minutes time resolution. Uh, you can see the results in like, you know, uh, figure number one and two, it was very successful. Uh, we're still working on like, you know, data QA, QC separating emergent from depositions, but uh, things are going well. It's gonna be uploaded in ARM archive in November. Uh, now, uh, for the research education integration, is very important for me as a university faculty. Uh, Python is very powerful for the any data analysis. Uh, I will be happy to offer any free, you know, Python 101 workshop to help out people set up Anaconda toolboxes and uh, et cetera, et cetera. So if you're interested in, just email me. Thank you. Wow, great offer, okay. Hudson and Jathar next. Two figures from a paper published last year. Uh, the upper two on the left and the upper one on the right show what happens when there's consecutive hours of clouds. The accumulation mode concentration mean particle diameter goes up due to cloud processing. You can see that on the right in a time span for the spectrum. Uh, the lower two panels on the left and the lower one on the right show what happens when you have no clouds for several hours. Nothing happens to the accumulation mode. The uh, Aitken mode concentration goes up. The Aitken mode mean particle diameter goes down because small particles are coming in from photochemistry. And then eventually they get big enough and grow. And on the right, you can see nothing happens to the accumulation mode when there's no clouds. And uh, both of these processes happen only during the day, daylight, and we, this is only one month, so we'd like to stretch this out to other seasons. Thank you. Interesting, okay. Uh, Jathar Jimenez on deck. Uh, thanks, Jim and Nicole. This is um, work done by graduate student uh, Yi Kong He, uh, who's a graduate student with me here at Colorado State University. Uh, and um, we are exploring whether uh, chamber data uh, performed for alpha pinene ozonolysis uh, under uh, nucleation uh, conditions and under low relative humidity conditions can be leveraged to explain the particle phase state of uh, alpha pinene SOA. And so the figure here shows um, model predictions uh, for various uh, bulk diffusion coefficients uh, compared against measurements for SOA mass concentrations, uh, O to C ratio, and the evolution of the number size distribution. And the takeaway is that uh, our model, which is a detailed chemistry and microphysics model, um, constrains the SOA for alpha pinene ozonolysis uh, to a dB value of somewhere between 1 and 4, 10 to the negative 19 meters square per second, uh, which is definitely in the semi-solid region and has implications for uh, gas particle partitioning and uh, evolution in the atmosphere. Great. Jimenez Kroll. Um, thank you. Um, so the slide has uh, three different projects that I will describe briefly on the left. Um, we have <clears throat> the SOA formation in 10 seconds that we've been studying, and, and I talked last year about how when you model the re very rapid rise, we can say can constrain the accommodation coefficient to be one. But now if you wait a few hours, you can see the evaporation of the SOA as the SOA is denuded by the chamber walls. And in the bottom, you can see that from that you can, if you do that with different seeds, you can estimate the accommodation coefficient in red. 
Uh, the middle project is about IOPOX SOA. So we've taken the explicit model of IOPOX SOA and run it uh, on the climate model, the Yankar model. And in the middle, you have a map of IOPOX SOA in the future divided by the present by one of the climate scenarios. And in the bottom, you see that the results depend on the scenario. Those are the bars with colors and are generally much higher than the DBS uh, results. Oops. And then on the right, uh, we study the wall losses in, in continuous chambers, and we see that uh, that they matter, and and that uh, having the SOA be relatively constant with with C um, does not show that they don't matter. Thank you. Great, thanks, Jose. So we have Kroll and then Lawler. All right, hi everyone. Um, so this work done in collaboration with Colette Heald is aimed at better understanding sulfate formation from the oxidation of dimethyl sulfide, or DMS. This is the main natural source of sulfur in the atmosphere, but the mechanism itself is quite uncertain, especially under low NOx conditions. And this could lead to errors in model sulfate levels. So we've been doing chamber studies on DMS oxidation using several real-time mass spectrometers to measure products. On the bottom left are some preliminary results looking at gas phase species only. We see some well-known products such as DMSO, some relatively new products such as the peroxy compound identified by Veris and coworkers, and some other previously unmeasured ones. From these, we're, we're working on improving the mechanism and trying to derive kinetic parameters and aerosol formation rates. Um, in parallel, on the global modeling side, we've been adding chemical detail to the DMS chemistry in CAMCAM, which is part of the CESM model, which right now is highly simplified. We're adding oxidation by halogens, more sulfur-containing species, and aqueous phase chemistry. And we're also starting to evaluate the scheme against observation, as shown here on the bottom right uh, in this model ATOM comparison. For next steps, we plan emergence efforts by using lab results to update the chemistry in the model. Thanks. Thanks. OK, Lawler and Lewis. Okay, so these are um, sort of unexpected observations that we made during the um, 2016 high-scale campaign at the SGP ground site. We identified events of fungal fragments that were smaller and more numerous than we knew existed, probably bits of fungal spores that burst in the atmosphere. So the approach was measurements uh, size-resolved aerosol using the TD SIMS, and we identified the fragments by the detection of chitin, um, corona of cell, uh, fungal cell walls, and sugar cell sugar alcohols within the cells. At the top right, um, there's a couple of aerosol size distributions. In red is an event period, in black is non-event. You can see that during this particular event, uh, there's an enhancement in these sort of 20 to 50 nanometer particles, which is right where we're measuring with the TD SIMS. And uh, below that is an example of mass spectrum of these particles, where in the blue colors you see these. Uh, sugar alcohols and the red colors are these chitin decomposition products. And uh, these are, could be potentially a source, a new source of fungal allergens or ice nuclei. Our paper is cited below. Thanks, Mike. So, Lewis and Lou on deck. Hi, this is Ernie Lewis. I, this is work that I've been doing with Art Sedlicek and Tim O'Nash at Aerodyne. We're looking at the black carbon mixing state life cycle um, measurements from the sp2 which gives the mass of black carbon and some proxy for the amount of coating on there so the left axis the bottom axis is time and we've kind of the art showed this yesterday the day before in his talk split this into three regions which we're calling local regime uh regional regime and global regime kind of up to an hour is local an hour to a day or so is the the regional and then is global. The left is the mass of the coating to the mass of the black carbon for a hundred nanometer diameter black carbon bin. And you can see early in the fire, it starts very low and it increases. It levels off in the regional regime. And then with oracles and LASIK and so a few previous measurements, we get what might be happening in the, in the far regime, the global regime, and it looks like we lose coating again. This is still controversial. Some of the oracles flights above the free in the free troposphere don't quite show this, and we're trying to figure out why. But we look like we might be able to get kind of a complete story of the whole mixing uh, state life cycle for black carbon now, and we're pretty excited about this. Thanks, Ernie. Lou Meskidzi. Uh, in this study, we uh, evaluate uh, aerosol IMP uh, 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 representation in the CSM model with the observation from the STP and aerosol ice uh, formation closure studies. We evaluate uh, CSM simulate uh, the aerosol number at the surface area area concentrations in the in the fine mode and cost mode with uh, observations and uh, 
We also uh, evaluate the model, the dust and mass concentration with the improved uh, observations. So once we uh, evaluate uh, the model, the aerosol and the, uh, the number of the surface area concentration, we use that uh, into the ice nucleation polymerization to, to calculate the IMP concentration and compare with the observation like from pine and the CFD to CFDC to see if they match uh, with each other. And uh, in upper right, you can see the the model the, using the uh, near man parameterization agree with the observation. However, because the model underestimating the, the surface area concentrations then is indicating that parameterization has some issue while the demand is lower than observations then this is consistent with the, with the model the uh, normal concentration is, is too low compared with the observations. Thanks. Let's get the Perkins. Hi, this is from the paper that will be submitted early next week. And we have carried out about eight month measurements for aerosol size distribution and number concentration in Raleigh, North Carolina. And this was done using both stationary and mobile platforms before and during COVID-19 pandemic. And I have these three take home messages that I think are, are important for aerosol number budget typical for the Southeast US cities. Number one, we observed this uh, uh, particle formations, both class A that happens near the ground and class B that happens aloft are quite common in Southeast uh, US cities, about five per month. And these nucleation events are large, encompassing about 10 to hundreds of kilometers. Uh, number two, we have found multiple unique and distinct anthropogenic sources of sub 10 nanometer size particles that have significant contribution to aerosol number budget. And they are continuous and they are contributing almost every day. And we observed also slight reduction of ultrafine particle number concentration due to COVID-19. However, it's much smaller than about 75% reduction in average daily traffic. Thank you. Thanks. We got Perkins and Petters next after that. All right. So uh, we're working on putting together some data from the uh, ARM SGP site that has a very large data set with a lot of different instruments into a nice uh, CCN product. So we currently have, <coughs> we've got merged size distributions and hygroscopicity measurements, uh, and then combining that with measured CCN spectra and doing some quality assurance with ACSM and nephilometer data um, and have this nice product that should be ready to archive this summer. Uh, and the advantage of this product over the uh, just normal measured CCN spectra is that it greatly expands the supersaturation range that you can look at getting down to very low supersaturation and also quite high. Um, we're doing some analysis looking at the, the variability in this data set currently. Thanks. All right. Um, as That's Nicholas right. has uh, mentioned, we've been tracking new particle formation and growth events. And one of the questions we have is whether this new particle formation is initiated at the surface or aloft. And we believe that eddy covariance flux measurements can help to address this question. Uh, so the bottom panel in the figure shows the typical banana event with new particles appearing at about five nanometers and around noon time. Um, and if you extrapolate the growth rate, it starts at about uh, 10 a.m. Um, however, the SMPS measurements are too slow for flux measurements. So what you can do is take uh, two CPCs with different cutoff diameters um, and then uh, monitor the new, for new particle formation at high frequency. And the middle panel shows you the 2.5 to 10 nanometer number concentration started, uh, starting at about 10 a.m. with the expected start time of the nucleation event. So it's now possible to run uh, the eddy covariance particle uh, number flux system together with a dual CPC. So the top panel and the black line shows you uh, the uh, particle number flux during that nucleation event. And we see in this particular case, a strong upward flux uh, suggesting that the nucleation is initiated at the surface. And this is mostly an advert. So we will be deploying this to the SGP in the fall, uh, pandemic permitting and hopefully during the Tracer IOP in 2021. And if you have any comments or suggestions, uh, we welcome that input. Thank you. Hey, Pierce Pratt. So very complimentary what Marcus was just talking about. Um, we are looking at um, the vertical profile of aerosol nucleation growth during the previous high scale event. Now there wasn't 
uh, eddy covariance measurements like Marcus was just talking about, but there was aircraft uh, and the aircraft was measuring uh, size and, and um, ultrafine particles. Uh, and in a few of the days, they nailed the timing of getting profiles of the boundary layer just before the new particle formation was observed at the surface. And so this is one of those days on the left showing that ultrafine particles, this is the number of particles from three to 10 nanometers, were observed at the top of the boundary layer um, of, uh, within uh, uh, 10 to 30 minutes before the, uh, it was observed at the surface. Uh, and then uh, on the top right is the surface nucleation and growth that day. And you can see the particles show up uh, when they're already a bit larger, meaning they've nucleated and grown before reaching the surface. Uh, we are currently modeling this uh, initially in sort of the traditional well-mixed boundary layer sense, and we can generally reproduce these nucleation events, but you can see the nucleation is starting right from, from, from um, the smallest sizes. So um, in this case, uh, we are going to, the goal is to extend this to be column modeling where we'll have vertical turbulence and mixing and gradients in uh, concentrations. And we're going to try to attribute why the nucleation is starting at the top of the boundary layer on some of these days uh, and then later mixing to the surface. Okay. Uh, Pratt Schilling on deck. This is a highlight of our recent paper published in ESNT, led by my PhD student, Matt Gunch, and postdoc, Jun Liu. Uh, we show results from a, a summertime field campaign at a look to point in the Alaskan Arctic, where we found the main particle types identified by single particle mass back included organic carbon uh, internally mixed with amines and sulfate, sea salt, aerosol, and soot from diesel combustion. There was an ACSM, present, which measured organic aerosol and sulfate to be the dominant non-refractory components, which were internally mixed with the organic carbon and soot particle types. And notably, the organic aerosol mass and the amine-containing particles increased during observed growth events. The concentrations of the non-refractory mass measured by the single particle mass spec and ACSM were, in, were within agreement. And since this is a coastal oil field site, uh, with significant sea salt aerosol and combustion emissions, it should be noted that nearly 40% of the aerosol mass on average was refractory. Um, and that's something to consider for these coastal sites. Thank you. Thanks, Gary. Shilling, Shiraiwa. Okay, so what we're trying to do here is evaluate uh, equilibrium partitioning, uh, essentially to understand phase separation in aerosol. So what we did was we ran two types of experiments. One experiment where we co-condensed uh, two SOA precursors. Uh, we did some uh, typical uh, SOA modeling on that, determined that they formed a well-mixed phase. And then in the other type of experiment, we made SOA particles, aged them overnight photochemically in the chamber, and then tried to redeposit fresh SOA on top of that. Uh, we found that in this case with the aged uh, SOA, fresh SOA was not able to partition into it, even up to about 85% uh, relative humidity. So this seems to indicate that aging really has a profound effect on uh, the ability of SOA to diffuse into uh, pre-existing SOA. Thanks. Uh, Shiraiwa Srivastava. Hi, so I want to introduce two studies that we recently did. So one is about predictions of viscosity of organic aerosols uh, from volatility distributions. So in the past, we developed a method to calculate Ross Armstrong temperature based on elemental composition. But in this work, we uh, have equation uh, as a function of volatility and O2C ratio. So as you see that the lower volatility leads to higher uh, uh, viscosity and that compare with measured volatility distributions, which agree well with the global distribution. On the other work, we look into the mass accommodation. So the mass accommodation coefficient often assumed uh, without specifying how deep the molecule penetrates, but we developed the method uh, uh, accounting for that. And then we show that the, for semi-volatile and intermediate uh, volatility compounds, alpha could be significantly reduced. Um, so th this work is uh, coming up in ACPD. Great. Uh... Hi, um, so um, yeah, I want to acknowledge ASR, my DOE, BER, Early Career Award, and also my postdoc, Mega, for this work. 
uh, and we are modeling reactive uptake of isoprene epoxidial SOA on aqueous bi ammonium bisulfate seeds measured at the M-cell uh, uh, M cell Defron chamber in laboratory. And we want to get insights into processes governing IEPOX SOA. And the figures on the right top right here show the, the measurements in the black uh, of both aerosol no number and then also different type of model predictions. And we in the green is homogeneous mixing. And we see that it, it over predicts aerosol growth a lot. Whereas when we include the self-limiting effects of IEPOX SOA, uh, where the IPOX SOA on the uh, shell limits further uptake, it more or less agrees with measurements. There are still significant uncertainties in both measurements and models about composition of IPOX SOA. And when we perturb different modeling parameters related to gas particle partitioning of tetras, oligomerization time scale of semi volatile tetras, gas phase wall loss, and reaction kinetics, we find that these produce very different IPOX SOA compositions. We are trying to gain further insights by looking at other uh, measured parameters. And then uh, our next steps are to include these modeling insights into WorfCam and DOE 3SM models and apply to field campaigns like Amazon and Highscale at SGP. OK. So Wadowitz, Thornton on deck. Hey, uh, so last year, we used Jan Schilling's environmental chamber to measure the photolysis frequencies of a variety of SOA compositions. Um, and we tried to capture the natural variability in biogenic precursors and conditions. Uh, we found very short removal time scales for most types of SOA tested. Um, that was on the order of uh, shorter than 10 hours. Uh, but we also found these non photolabile cores that can hang around for potentially much, much longer. Um, so please check out our recent paper published in ESNT. Uh, and in that paper, also with the help of Manish, we used WorfCam models to model how photolysis removes SOA in the Amazon, as we found this to be the dominant removal mechanism. Great, thanks. Uh, so we have Thornton and then West on deck. Okay, uh, can you hear me? Absolutely. Okay, good. Um, hello everyone. I'll summarize some work appearing in the journal um, ACS Earth and Space Chemistry uh, with the co-authors you see on the screen there. Um, we use an explicit chemical mechanism of isoprene oxidation with online vapor pressure driven partitioning to predict isoprene SOA formed in about 30 different chamber experiments. And we find that the model does uh, relatively quite well, especially for low NOx conditions, uh, given the limited tuning and assumptions that go into the model. Um, and what we learned from this exercise is that the chemical conditions in the chamber, um, chambers are rather different from the atmosphere surprise, surprise, um, but in ways that make using parameterizations based on the chamber observations alone rather problematic uh, without first using such a chemical mechanism for interpretation. We illustrate this issue by comparing isoprene SOA predicted from two WarfCam simulations of the Go Amazon campaign, one using a parameterization based on the explicit me mechanism developed in this work and one using a volatility basis set obtained by directly fitting the chamber observations. And the two simulations produce rather different amounts of diff and distributions of isoprene SOA, even though they're tied to the same set of chamber experiments. So I'll stop there. Thanks. Thanks, Joel. West, uh, Yi on deck. Thanks, Jim. So this is joint work between a group at CMU who had a, a single particle measured data from the field and a group at Illinois who are using uh, simulated data. And we were asking a very basic question, which is just, if you want to measure the mixing state of an aerosol, how many particles should you actually go out and sample to do that? So we uh, use a quantified measurement of the mixing state given by this mixing state index chi. And I guess the bottom line, if you look at the right hand plot there, is that you need fairly large numbers of particles to be able to get accurate measures of the mixing state. So even with 10,000 particles, you could be having up to 10% errors and less than 10,000 particles, you could have really pretty big errors. Uh, I should say all of this work was led by Jessica Gasparak, uh, who's a grad student at Illinois. Thanks, Matt. Uh, we have uh, Yi and then Zaviri next after that. You there, Lindsay? Yes. Great. These are two-dimensional chromatograms of selected filter samples from Go Amazon showing the chemical complexity of sampled air. In fact, we observed 1,484 unique compounds, and we have generated timelines to conduct statistical analyses 
that will lead to source apportionment and identification of new tracers with specific chemical signatures. Globally, this picture repeats itself. Um, there are many thousands of compounds uniquely created in our atmosphere. And so while it is typical to focus analyses on a few well-known tracers, we have now taken an approach of amassing and analyzing electron impact mass spectra of the numerous compounds so that we can start to identify new tracers of global atmospheric importance, even in the absence of known chemical identity. So this library is available to the community so that we can collectively work towards a better chemical characterization of organic aerosols. Thank you. Thanks, Lindsay. Okay, Zaviri Zelenyuk. Hi, uh, yes. So uh, in this study, we probed the phase state of H alpha pinene SOA as a function of RH uh, in terms of bulk diffusivity of semi volatile organic compounds that are partitioning to this aerosol. So so far, you know, we've seen that um, SOA under dry condition is, is viscous and has very low diffusivity. But here we find that even as the RH increases, uh, the, the effective bulk diffusion coefficient is still low enough to present enough uh, diffusion limitation. And uh, so this work is published in, uh, in the recent ESNT paper uh, earlier this year. And basically this, the implication of this uh, low diffusivity in aged SOA is that the SVOCs would then favor the growth of smaller particles uh, instead of the larger viscous particles. And so it facilita facilitates the growth of uh, ultrafine particles to CCN size, et cetera. Thank you. Thanks, Raul. Uh, Zelenyuk and Volkmer. In these studies, we investigated the effect of aerosol acidity on composition and volatility of alpha pinene and isoprene derived SOA particles. We show that multiphase chemistry between oxidation products of isoprene and alpha pinene and um, acidic ammonium bisulfate particles lead to formation of low volatility compounds like organosulfate and oligomers and a decrease in highly oxidized molecule content. For example, for alpha pinene SOA particles, we find that non volatile fraction of alpha pinene SOA coatings from on ammonium bisulfate seed is increasing from 30% to almost 90% as we decrease in the thickness of organic coatings. And for IPOX SOA, we show that when particles, when IPOX SOA form on ammonium bisulfate seeds, the fraction of non volatile fraction is twice as large as that observed for ammonium sulfate, non-acidic seeds, and overall volatility of IPOX SOA orders of magnitude lower than isoprene with oxidation SOA. Thank you. Thanks, Ala. And then finally, Reiner Volkmer. You there, Hello, Reiner? everybody. Thanks hey. for giving us, uh, I'm here. Hello. Good. Go for it. Can you hear me? Okay. Uh oh. Opportunity to present this here. Um, it's uh, an ongoing laboratory study about uh, perception of salting effects on aqueous SOA partitioning and growth. And uh, so, generally, I epox is one of the precursors that is considered a precursor for aqueous SOA, but less attention has been paid to these hydroperoxides. Um, salts can modify strongly the volatility and partitioning of uh, aqueous SOA precursors by forming hydrogen bonds. Uh, and what we have learned so far is that uh, the hydrogen bonds for the isopu is uh, similar than uh, those for glyoxal, hydrated glyoxal, uh, suggesting that isopu may undergo a section of salting in. And uh, one problem is that uh, these compounds are not commercially available, they need to be synthesized. Uh, so we have uh, started to embark on characterizations of the structure activity relationships for different hydroperoxides uh, by actually uh, synthesizing them from uh, symmetric alkenes, uh, which overcomes uh, the limited mass available for them. And we seek uh, experimental confirmation for whether these hydroperoxides more generally are salting in. Thanks, Reiner. So that's it. Uh, so there's, uh, there's a lot to take in. The slides will be available on the agenda. So if you uh, uh, go to the DOE website, you will be able to see these.
For those of you who are presenters, um, keep in mind that these slides are available just to the general public. And so uh, if you wish to uh, re-edit any of your material, um, let Nicole or I know about that. Uh, you know, some of some of you may not have been aware that this is going to be generally available for, for those of you. Uh, okay, so let's, uh, not bad, we're, we're only three minutes behind, uh, much better than I thought. Uh, next on our agenda is a presentation from John Schilling, who is uh, what we call a data translator or translator, I guess, for the aerosol processes working group. And so John can explain what that is for those of you who uh, haven't heard of such a thing. And uh, yeah, looks like he's ready to go. Go ahead, John. So, um, can you hear me and see the slides? Okay. It's, it's good, John. Oh, sorry. Okay, great. So what I would want to talk about today a little bit is um, some aerosol related data products that you uh, may or may not be aware of. I'm the aerosol translator and the short story about what exactly an aerosol translator is, is that it's just someone to help uh, make better use of the aerosol data for, for uh, you in, in your own research. Uh, so I'll talk about some of the products and I think uh, it will make it more clear about exactly what this aerosol translator role is. Uh, so, so first I wanted to make some people aware of some new data products that are coming online. So uh, data products are simply uh, data that's available on the ARM server for you to use in your research. Uh, we have an ACSM V1 data stream. This is uh, currently available for uh, data from SGP and ENA. And this daily, runs daily in real time and provides calibrated uh, ACSM species concentrations to typical uh, organic nitrate sulfate. Uh, ammonium with some QAQC, and we've also calculated ACSM volume, try to facilitate comparison to other instruments. Uh, at this point, it assumes a CE of one, but you'll see in a few slides some uh, work we're doing to try to get around that. Uh, ozone B1 data stream is available now. This is essentially calibrated ozone concentrations at uh, SGP, Olictoc, and ENA. Uh, again, these things run in, in uh, near real time. Uh, this one is a little bit more complicated because there's some uh, variability in the background that we have to uh, take a running average of, uh, but this allows you to get ozone data in real time, uh, calibrated ozone data. Uh, there's another two, two more CCN products that I don't think people are aware of that have actually been available for some time, but I think are, are quite useful. One is an average, a CCN average, and this basically takes CCN concentrations at multiple supersaturation set points and averages them so that you get a single CCN number concentration at a particular supersaturation. And then what, uh, this was largely developed by uh, GK at PNNL. So he takes that information then and fits the data so that you get a, a CCN spectrum as a function of supersaturation. And, and these are available for use. So I wanted to draw your attention to that. Uh, what we're also trying to do is um, what's called harmonization. And uh, you know there was an interesting talk by Ken Karslot earlier in the week talking about how difficult it is to um, merge different data sets from different sources. Uh, and this harmonization effort is an effort to try to make that somewhat easier, we hope. Um, so we're generating these harmonized data streams for nano SMPS, SMPS, UHAS, and APS. And what this involves is putting all the size distributions in the same units with the same names when, when applicable. So, so this will facilitate, again, intercomparison and hopefully use in larger scale models. Um, there's a lot of information in there um, about the size distributions so that if you need to manipulate them, you can. But we've also, again, tried to calculate some of these integrated uh, concentrations like uh, integrated number concentration, volume, and surface area to make it a, hopefully a little bit easier to people to uh, use the data so that you don't have to uh, recode your own code to do that, especially given sometimes things are not named consistently between different data sources. And there's also QA, QC, QC checks in the data. Um, finally, uh, this is work not led by my group, but led by uh, Scott Collis, another aerosol translator at Argonne Laboratory. Uh, he's running, uh, he's trying to modernize the legacy Igor code to process SP2 data in real time. To, 
uh, first of all, make this data more accessible more quickly, but also to just, you know, the SP2 data generates an incredible amount of data. So hopefully this takes a little bit of the burden off of some of the mentors in calculating this by hand. So essentially what they've done is they've uh, implemented this code to calculate uh, BC mass and uh, diameter to get essentially BC size distributions. Uh, they're implementing this right now and comparing it to Igor. And, and so far, I think that uh, process is going well. So soon, what we hope is that there will be um, real-time calculations of BC size distributions as well. Okay, so um, what I want to talk about now is um, what we call VAPs. And a VAP is basically um, a data stream that has had extra calculation or manipulation done to it. Um, so, uh, first of all, we have these operational VAPs that are, are running. These run kind of uh, for almost all the data sets that are available in ARM archive. So, one of these is the aerosol optical properties VAP. It's called AOP. And this combines uh, PSAP extinction with nephilometer scattering to calculate a lot of the aerosol optical properties that you might be interested in. Um, there's a whole um, laundry list of them almost. Um, including things like absorption coefficients, Kingle scattering albedo, angstrom exponents for uh, both absorption and scattering, asymmetry parameter, corrected scattering, et cetera. Uh, almost any kind of aerosol optical property that you'd want to calculate from um, in situ instruments are in this file. And, and this is kind of the file that we would like people to use because it collects a lot, it collects kind of everything in one file, it has a lot of corrections done to it and, and those kind of things. Um, We've recently upgraded this to do a better job at detecting um, when these PSAP filter chambers occur. So this should improve the data availability for this, this data stream. We also have these aerosol optical depth um, VAPs. Uh, this one in particular is using MSR, MFRSR data, which is a, a passive remote sensor to calculate AOD at seven wavelengths. Uh, we've recently uh, ARM is recently, or in the process maybe is a better way to say it, upgrading these instruments to include the 16, um, 1620 nanometer channel. Um, so this up, runs autonomously at many sites, uh, but it needs some hand processing at sites where there's frequent cloud cover. And this is related to um, how this instrument essentially takes a I naught measurement. Um, so we are in the process of updating these um, I naught measurements for sites where there is a lot of cloud cover that are challenging and we and that data is, is available or is appearing uh, now. We anticipate ENA and MCQ, which was a field mission in the Southern Ocean, being processed this, this FY. Some other um, VAPs related to AOD that we're producing this year is this VAP called QC AOD. Um, and these individual AOD products sometimes uh, vary in continuity and data quality and in resolution due to in differences in the instruments. There's also different uh, AODs from different instruments that are uh, available in the ARM data set. So, so this data stream tries to integrate some of these different AOD measurements and uh, generate nearly continuous uh, report of combined AOD. Uh, right now, because of the instrument uh, limitations. This is at two wavelengths, 500 and 870. And it's for high uh, temporal time resolution and for a 20 year, 21 year period at SGP. And this is available now and it just became uh, available pretty recently. Um, as I said earlier, we're working a lot with the ACSM data to try to improve um, the availability of that data and to improve um, the reliability of that data as anyone who works with AMS or ACSM knows, this um, issue of collection efficiency is a big deal. So what we've done is we've implemented the Middlebrook, uh, the Middlebrook Composition Dependent Collection Efficiency Algorithm to uh, apply to our autonomous data. We're in the process of doing this now. We've um, implemented it. We're kind of going through the testing on SGP. And I've just shown a comparison in the bottom right to, for, of aerosol volume derived from the, uh, this composition dependent collection efficiency to SMPS. And you can see it's not perfect, but it significantly improves um, and, and makes it quite good in, in, in many cases, the comparison between the SMPS derived volume and the ACSM derived, ACSM -derived volume. 
Uh, so this we expect to be online by the end of this year for SGP, and then we'll look at it for other sites where ACSMs are deployed. We're working on a cap of app. Um, what this does is it takes, it combines the size distribution information from uh, right now the SMPS and the CCN data from the CCNC, and it calculates kappa. This is calculated at each value of supersaturation. Um, again, we're implementing this code right, right now. We've got some preliminary data for SGP, and that's kind of shown uh, in the bottom right. Uh, and we expect that it will be released um, uh, late this year, early next year for SGP, and then we're going to uh, work on ENA next. Some of the other sites have an additional challenge that um, we don't have an SMPS, we have a, a other size distribution information, Austin, the UHSS, and um, so we're working with that data. We're also trying to implement a reboot of uh, uh, what's called a CCN vertical profile. This was developed actually quite a long time ago now by uh, Steve Gann, Sally, and Don Collins. And what this VAP does is it, it generates uh, vertical profiles of CCN number concentration um, at different supersaturation values that are measured by the CCNC. So this is valid for up to cloud base. Um, this will run autonomously at sites where there's a CCNC and, and a LIDAR. We use the LIDAR to get the vertical profile of the aerosol and the CCNC to get the, uh, the CCN saturations or the CCN number at different saturations. Um, we think this will, this will start to be available in early uh, next year. Um, and we're working on the SGP site. And the plan is to kind of validate this VAP with aircraft data. Uh, and then I think I just heard the timer go off. Is that right, Jim? Yeah, that's right. I'll just briefly go through what we ex you know, what we're planning for next year. Um, we're also planning an AOD best estimate. This combines um, AODs from a wide variety of both um, of different kinds of passive, passive sensors to try to make a, a best estimate um, of um, you know, what AOD we think is really the best representation of the true AOD. We're starting to work on a merge size distribution. This is something that's been asked for uh, extensively, but it's actually quite challenging. Um, so I think I will end there and just go on to the next slide, just indicating that there's a, a group of scientists that um, perform these aerosol translators. It's just not me. So if you need data products from other areas, uh, this slide shows the people you can get in touch with. Thanks. Thanks, John. That's, that was great. I mean, I think uh, this is a really important job. Uh, if, uh, if the DOE data is uh, important to you, and if you're not getting what you think you should be getting out of the data, or if you're just generally confused, John's the person that can help you with a lot of these things. Uh, so take advantage of, uh, of this great resource. So, um, okay, so uh, I don't believe, did we, Nicole, have any questions, uh, brief questions for John? Um, I don't see any right now. Okay. People can still write in and John will answer. That's right, yeah. So uh, if you have any questions, I guess it looks like we're mostly using chat. Um, that's, that's great, I kind of prefer it myself. But if, uh, if you just go ahead and write questions in and then uh, maybe John can keep an eye on it, uh, see if there's a, a question that he could answer. So we'll just go uh, this way. Uh, it, it's gonna be pretty fast paced today. So uh, I think we'll probably have to make use of chat more than anything for, for having questions uh, answered and such. Okay, so now we are in that part of the uh, agenda. We traditionally uh, set aside for very brief uh, summaries of the uh, breakouts that we've had this week. Uh, it's a chance to just uh, uh, hear about uh, those that you may have missed, but also to kind of get uh, the perspectives of the people who kind of led these breakouts as to what they felt were important takeaways. And uh, again, uh, I will just uh, have a, a timer that will just remind you after uh, five minutes and then um, you can start your closing comments. And so uh, we're gonna start sort of uh, chronologically, uh, go through it chronologically. Uh, Fawn's gonna talk about the ARM aerial instrumentation uh, session and take it away. 
Okay, thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, this is fun. I would just uh, uh, kind of uh, summarize uh, what uh, uh, we talked about during our ARM aerial instrument instrumentation update and the discussion session. And this session is convened uh, um, by me and uh, Derry from Sandia and Bayard Smith from uh, PNL. Uh, the session start with uh, Bayard just the overview of what is the current status of our new uh, research aircraft Challenger A50 and the, some update on the Arctic shark and uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, he also introduced uh, the uh, early held in March there is an invitation based uh, uh, aerial instrumentation workshop. Before the workshop, we received 42 white paper. Those papers most introduced a different potential instrumentation for AF. Then after that, um, uh, after we invited uh, several, uh, about uh, 59 people joined the workshop, 27 of them are invited expert in the field. And, and uh, there is a 45 presentation was given during the workshop. Uh, most of the, uh, we typically start uh, each session like aerosol, cloud uh, radiation. Those sessions start with the AF staff gives a brief uh, capability. And then we have someone to proxy to, um, if they're not uh, the, there to talk about the white paper presentation and the also have some motivated uh, uh, presentation by invited experts. Then Bill to briefly gave the challenging 850 timelines that you can see from here, we expect uh, we will have a uh, 2022, we'll, uh, there is uh, our first uh, science and engineer test to fly. And the following year, we will hope to have the first uh, science mission, but those science mission will all focus on the uh, continent, continental US. And then we will expand a little bit more during the 2024 and hopefully we will be ready for the international mission in 2025. And for Arctic shark, it's just a start with uh, <clears throat> uh, introduced to Miss Chap during the 2019. And, uh, the except after that, uh, AF and the PNL work hard to bring the Arctic shark uh, <clears throat> back to business. So after a lot of analysis and uh, um, all the mitig uh, risk uh, uh, mitigation um, discussion, then we have the uh, decided the acceptance test of fly will happen next year in June, and. Uh, uh, currently, uh, the AF US group working on flights uh, uh, to collaborate with the partners using their tar Tiger Shark to fly our our, uh, our um, mission payload. And uh, we expect the first science mission will be clear air over the SGP side. And then the most exciting part is that Jason gave us an overview of all the modifications that are going to happen with the uh, Challenger 850. And I think uh, you can say there are a lot of uh, details, uh, but the most exciting point is uh, we're going to have uh, three attach points and each wing for the wing pylon. That gives us a lot of uh, capability to um, carry on uh, such a mission. And also there is a Zenith and Nadir uh, um, circular aperture uh, will be available. So that will open another door for AF uh, new aircraft to carry potential LIDAR and uh, uh, also work with other agencies. So then we launched a, a polling questions to ask participants wait, uh, what they think we should uh, implement next. Here's uh, the result of most people First and second uh, choice all choose the LiDAR. And then the third choice is the drop sound unit. And uh, also I introduced the instruments uh, for challenging A50 proposed and uh, I introduced them uh, in two categories, uh, short term and the long term, middle or long term. And the based uh, polling uh, results here is say like uh, 
people are more interested in get the size distribution, uh, the set, um, another system counter for the aerial facility, and also uh, better as, uh, estimate of water vapor content at a high frequency. And the, this is my last slide. It's uh, uh, the polling results from a uh, uh, kind of a, the community gave us a priority for the UAV and the TBS implementation, uh, implementation options. Thanks. Okay, and so uh, if anybody uh, has any questions, uh, just go to the chat. Uh, we'll go on to the next one. This is on shortwave absorbing aerosols and their interactions with large scale environment. Uh, and Paquita is gonna um, give an overview of that. Thank you. Let me put this. So we had this breakout on um, Tuesday afternoon, and uh, despite the broad title, um, the focus was mostly on the uh, LASIK campaign held on Ascension Island in the Southeast Atlantic, which ended in um, October 2017. So we are, um, you know, very engrossed in the analysis of that, and um, we had we had a good session. We had about 130 people attendees. Uh, the session was kind of split into half aerosol focused presentations and half more on uh, clouds. So I'm just highlighting the ones on this slide that are more focused on, um, on the aerosol processes. Um, Art Sedlicek and Amy Dabraki both had presentations that were um, integrating the LASIK uh, aerosol composition studies with those from um, your, you know, other campaigns. Uh, one feature that was really nice for this campaign, it, you know, it's a very re remote environment, but there were two other uh, aircraft campaigns going on at the same time. UK uh, Clarify campaign was based out of Ascension and uh, NASA Oracle's uh, campaign overlapped with two months of um, LASIK. So um, there, yeah, the analysis is, um, you know, maturing into more of a synthesis. Um, Michal gave, is a newly funded investigator and she and um, colleagues are analyzing uh, filter measurements that they took on the two aircraft campaigns and linking those in with uh, the Ascension Island um, uh, data sets. Uh, Paul Barrett gave a presentation um, providing an overview on uh, the UK Clarify aircraft campaign um, you know, with also with a focus on the instrument intercomparisons. So the, um, the UK um, British aircraft did these like flybys of the LASIK uh, site and um, the, the in instrument intercomparison has been very uh, illuminating for uh, both of our campaigns. Uh, Pablo Saeed gave a talk on um, doing a CAPA analysis uh, towards uh, integrating that with his uh, WARF uh, CAM5 uh, modeling studies on aerosol indirect effects. And uh, Yang Feng gave a um, larger um, uh, evaluation of the uh, E3SM model um, over the seasonal cycle and uh, comparison to um, LASIK oracle observations. Uh, so I followed the format of the uh, template that Jim and Nicole provided. Um, these are some, so at the top are some um, things that are kind of on our to-do list. Uh, one is that, um, so this comparison between the uh, extinction and absorption measurements with Clarify, like we have a lot of confidence in the absorption uh, measurements coming out of Ascension. So this is wonderful because that uh, campaign focused on you know, absorbing aerosols and absorption is not an easy um, measurement to make. Um, the scattering measurements, there's still some uncertainty there. And one thing that's kind of come to the fore that is that it would be nice to have a newer um, filter correction scheme um, 
incorporated for the nephilometer scattering measurements um, than is it currently in place. So the, the VAP is currently a blend of the bond augurin and uh, Vercula corrections. Uh, the Kappa analysis, so um, Pablo's analysis is revealing CCN values that exceed those from the CPC at times. So there's been some discussion on how to produce a best estimate aerosol size distribution from that size. And um, yeah, we would like more uh, resolved uh, ACSM um, measurements. Uh, I think we have a plan in place to do so, I think. Um, kind of with the power of hindsight, uh, extinction values of both dry and ambient relative humidities uh, would be valuable for the, the model um, assessments. Uh, the micropulse LIDAR measurements. So uh, there's been two separate efforts to derive extinctions from those. And in comparison with the um, extinction vertical profiling that the, Cal the Clarify people did kind of makes clear that um, you can't really resolve the uh, Air, you know, the, aerosol, the aerosol vertical structure near where the clouds are, which is like a really um, kind of critical for where the aerosol and the cloud are interacting with each other. Um, you can't really resolve that with an MPL. So if DOE gets a, um, you know, a bucket of money falling out of the sky, um, more investment into extinction lighters, I think, would be pretty, pretty high value. And... Um, filter measurements. We talked about doing those early on, um, ultimately thought they were too ambitious to do. Um, I think we probably could have done them at that site uh, with the power of hindsight and those would have been valuable. Uh, so future plans, action items, uh, and it's been a great campaign. So I don't mean to sound overly critical, um, just following the, the format of um, those slides. Um, yeah, ongoing discussion uh, on the aerosol life cycle um, is continuing. And um, yeah, and, and just more, more um, I, I think over the next one or two years, we'll see more synergism with uh, synergistic analysis with these other campaigns that I think is going to be very uh, scientifically fruitful for understanding the um, biomass burning aerosol uh, life cycle. Um, yeah, um, we still need to do a LASIK overview paper. That's on my to-do list. Uh, ongoing is uh, we have the special issue in uh, ACP on um, everything that's coming out of the Southeast Atlantic. And uh, there will be a uh, session at the AMS uh, annual meeting. Um, Thanks, Vicky. Yeah, great. Thank, thanks very much. So uh, lots going on uh, with regards to the, the LASIK campaign. It's really great to hear. Uh, okay, uh, like always, uh, please direct questions to the chat. And so we'll go ahead without further ado and talk about our newest campaign with Dan Feldman, uh, who's gonna tell us all about uh, why we should all be sailors, right, Dan? That's right, can you hear me, Jim? I can. Okay, great. Um, and let's see if you, can you, you see my slides? Uh, yes. Okay, great. Um, so yeah, I'm just gonna provide a brief overview uh, of the sale campaign. Um, we had a breakout session yesterday and uh, with well over a hundred attendees, it was really exciting. Um, I'm going to, fo for those of you who uh, attended that yesterday, there's definitely some overlap here, but there's some new material. Um, and, um, and I just relate the uh, processes subgroup within SAIL, which includes uh, Allison Aiken, um, it includes Paul DeMott, Joanne Fan, um, Mackenzie Skiles, and, uh, and Jim here. Um, so, and I did want to thank Jim and Nicole for, uh, for providing me the opportunity to present here today. Um, yeah, so there's a, a big group of people um, with SAIL. Uh, the, uh, background here is that um, that we'd like to understand how these uh, how water resources are derived from mountainous watersheds since they're uh, really important for uh, for society for um, uh, for energy uh, development through hydropower for, for a lot of different reasons 
Um, and, um, and there's big uncertainties in atmospheric processes, especially um, the role of, of aerosols as uh, we heard about a little bit yesterday. Um, uh, so, uh, so, so SAIL is uh, the Surface Atmosphere Integrated Field Laboratory, which um, will be directly uh, co-located with a large effort that's already underway um, that's supported by the Subsurface Biogeochemical Research Program um, they have a SFA called the Watershed Function SFA that makes uh, canopy through bedrock observations uh, where uh, through SAIL adding uh, a significant enhancement by uh, providing um, atmospheric uh, science support and, and in collaboration and really synergy. Um, the SAIL campaign will deploy the second Armolo facility uh, to the East River Watershed, uh, which is near Crested Butte, Colorado, um, beginning uh, September of next year and extending almost two years through June of 2023. So we have uh, uh, two winters, two springs, and uh, one summer. Um, here's a perspective view of the, uh, of the watershed. It's 300 square kilometers, um, and uh, it, there's a uh, complex terrain. It, it extends from about 2,500 to 3,500 meters above sea level. Um, and a number of sins already, uh, observations already there. Um, uh, and so we have a lot of context for, uh, for the observations that SAIL will be bringing, uh, but, but definitely the uh, observations that have been made uh, uh, raise questions that, that SAIL will be able to answer. Um, and you know, ultimately we're trying to under, understand the, uh, the number of atmospheric processes that impact energy and, and mass budgets in the Colorado River. Um, uh, so fully 40% of the, um, the science objectives of SAIL pertain to aerosol processes. Um, I show uh, the, the role of aerosol um, uh, processes change, changes dramatically across seasons. Um, we can see on the right here the, uh, the, the, uh, the impact of, of, uh, of impurities on snow is quite, uh, quite uh, extreme. Uh, it's changing and uh, I'd like to understand um, you know, atmosphere and surface uh, deposition and, and what that, uh, what, uh, you know, a lot of the, the details associated with that. Um, aerosols also Im in, uh, impact precipitation in, in some um, complex ways. Um, and, and ultimately these have uh, impacts, uh, sort of downstream, so to speak, impacts on surface um, fluxes and surface energy balance. Um, there'll be about three dozen instruments, including the uh, uh, aerosol observing system, um, and a scanning radar. Um, and so uh, I mentioned dust on snow. It's, uh, it's a significant driver. Um, there are already measurements there, but we need to understand their sources. And I think um, uh, there's gonna be a lot of, uh, the AOS will certainly provide a lot of information about that, um, about their uh, life cycle, about aging. Um, and, um, and also there's, uh, there's uh, black carbon, um, and, uh, and even brown carbon. And so uh, these are things that uh, need to be studied and, and will be measured um, through the uh, sale campaign. Um, and uh, with respect to the, uh, the, uh, the bringing of a, of, a, of a precipitation radar, we'll be able to also understand um, how these impact the, uh, the, the location, the phase, the timing, of, of precipitation and, and uh, either moderate or extreme. Um, so, so it's actually, uh, there's a lot of exciting uh, types of analysis that can be done um, with, with these data. So I encourage you to take, uh, uh, to, to, uh, to contribute. Um, so, okay, uh, I know that's five minutes. So we have a lot of information, uh, a lot of background material from EPA that, um, from the Airborne Snow Observatory. Um, and from nearby uh, snow pit observations that show uh, what's been going on with, uh, in the area. Um, and I encourage you to take a look at the website, uh, email me or uh, join the mailing list. Um, so we have a lot of activity, including uh, an upcoming workshop. Um, and uh, and so, uh, so stay tuned um, and here are some questions for you to consider. Thanks. Yeah, and so uh, we'll have some time uh, at the end of this session to, uh, to actually uh, you know, perhaps talk about people's interest in sale. I mean, I think that's a, a relevant thing uh, in the context of this uh, get together. So, um, so yeah, so maybe Dan can hold on to those for the discussion questions if, the, if that comes up. Uh, okay, so next one is uh, Jay Wang. You there, Jay?
There he is? Uh, yes. Okay. So you're going to talk about Ace Ina. Yes. Can you? That's good. Okay. So can you see the screen? Okay. Well, uh, first, thanks, Jim and Nicole, for the opportunity to present the summary uh, of the Ace Ina session. Um, we had a well attended uh, session with about 100, over 150 attendees. And uh, uh, there were about 16 uh, presentations over a range of topics that using the measurement during the, the field campaign, which took place uh, in the summer, from the summer of 2017 to the winter of 2018. And the seven presentations, uh, seven of them are more closely related to uh, the aerosol process. So I'm also showing on the right side, this is a picture from Trish, uh, which is showing some of the key process, aerosol process in the marine boundary layer. And obviously, you have sea spray aerosol production, uh, free troposphere aerosol, including long range transport, continental emissions, and also newly formed particles that can entrain into the boundary layer, uh, where they can undergo uh, growth, condensation through condensation, coagulation, and cloud processes. Uh, so, the next, I will uh, just uh, talk uh, essentially going through uh, some of the key findings from the seven presentations. Um, Shahom uh, essentially uh, evaluated the performance of two uh, global climate models using the measurement both on board the aircraft and also um, the long-term measurement at the ENA site on um, Graciosa Island. And he found that uh, the both models grew reasonably well, uh, the E3SM and the CESM, which I think is a community earth system model, agree reasonably well with observed CC in terms of seasonality, magnitude, and vertical distribution. Uh, however, however um, uh, they do not do a very good job in predicting the small particle concentration. And one is over underestimate, uh, over uh, underestimate, one overestimate. And both model overestimate the mass loading of solid organics. And there is evidence to suggest that uh, E3SM may be too weak um, uh, in terms of condensation growth of the eight chemical particles. This is one of the main uh, pathway informed CC in the remote boundary layer and the CESM may be too weak on the long range transport. So Young uh, took a look at the vertical profiles of the aerosol properties uh, measured on board the aircraft. And what he found is on um, average, uh, the entrainment of free troposphere is really not a direct source of the CCN. This is because uh, the CCN concentration in the free troposphere is actually lower. So when actually, when they entrained the air uh, from the free troposphere entrained into the boundary layer, they actually directly dilute the CCN. Uh, what happens is there are much more um, smaller size eight chemical particles in the free troposphere. So when they entrain into the boundary layer, uh, they can grow and, and serve essentially the indirect source of the CCN. Uh, there are very strong seasonal variations of the CCN uh, due to uh, a, a combination of the reasons, uh, including the there are stronger influence of long range transport pollution during the summer season. And during the summer, uh, the particle also grow a little bit faster uh, due to the higher precursor concentration. And also uh, there's a relatively slower, uh, slow um, wet scavenging during the summer. And there's also evidence that suggest there's a stronger new particle formation during winter season. Uh, Maria looked at the, uh, the aerosol composition vertical profiles and also show uh, the, there's influence from both local and continental sources. And she also compared, uh, looked into the difference uh, the composition difference between the cloud uh, residue. This is uh, um, essentially measured using a sample using a CVI and also with the uh, interstitial aerosol particles. And uh, what she found out is the scavenging ratio is well correlated with dropping number concentration. Uh, the residue tends to be more relatively enriched in nitrate and amines and the less oxidized uh, the ambient aerosol. Um, Guangzhou looked into the growth of the eight chemical particles in the marine boundary layer. Um, this, as we mentioned earlier, this is one of the um, major process in forming CCN. Uh, what she found is actually only very uh, small fraction of the growth events, uh, the condensation growth was dominated by sulfate. And during uh, the majority of the events, uh, the condensation, uh, both organics and sulfate play a quite important role in the condensation growth. And this contribution of the organics uh, in terms of uh, um, condensation growth is currently not really well represented in uh, many global models. Uh, so uh, Jay 
Um, and Alex from Purdue University uh, essentially analyzed the particles, uh, collected particle samples using um, a number of uh, offline techniques, including the uh, SIGSM and also the uh, SEM EDX. They look into the particles that are doing the dry intrusion events, and those are uh, essentially drying the cold air, their descent uh, into the lower level atmosphere, including um, lower free troposphere and boundary layer. Um, so am I reach the time limit? You might have, yeah. Okay, so uh, again, uh, I just uh, goes very quickly. Uh, Daniel looked into the ice nucleation um, and found there's a much stronger uh, ice nuclear activity in the free troposphere, and some of them can be explained by composition. Allison talked about the future, and she also mentioned earlier during this session, uh, during the one uh, minute talk, essentially it's a very useful uh, mask uh, technique, essentially to get rid of the data that is, to exclude the data that is strongly influenced by local pollution. So in terms of uh, the future plans, um, um, we uh, collectively we have looked into a lot of processes. The next step will be combine model simulations, observations to understand the process that uh, respond to the large model biases and also to uh, combine a number of analysis to develop a budget of the marine boundary layer CCN uh, in this region. Um, I also want to mention we are also working on an overview paper, uh, um, and there is a special issue with the ACP, and also there will be a session uh, in the AMS meeting uh, next year. Um, thank you. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Jay. So, uh, so then we're going to wrap up the uh, breakout session with a discussion uh, by Chungai about the Southeast US uh, session. And then he's going to stay on to uh, talk a little bit about Tracer and where we are with that, uh, with that effort. Double header by Chungai. Great, Jim. Thanks. OK, uh, again, want to thank Jim and Nicole for uh, inviting me to present on our Southeast US breakout session. One word to describe it, lively. It was a lively time. Um, conveners for the session were me, Sean Serban, Scott Jane Grande, and Jim Mather, Nikki Hickman, and Joe Hardesty. And to jump right into it, you know, one big message that, uh, that we wanted to convey was that this is the first time ARM, ASR, and a site science team are working together for an AMF deployment in this manner, right? So our type of engagement with the community, the type of feedback we want is all going to be a little bit different than what, than what you might have kind of been expecting or is experiencing in the past. So presentations included uh, the first section talking about motivators and citing considerations for bringing the AMF3 to the Southeast US. And in the second half, we had a number of science presentations on Southeast US relevant drivers looking at land atmosphere interactions, aerosol drivers, and convective clouds. So one kind of theme that just kept coming up in all these presentations, especially in, in the discussions, were multi-scale heterogeneity, right? And it was, it was presented and discussed as both a challenge and an opportunity. And those two words I think are gonna be kind of characterizing our planning as a team and our engagement with the community leading up, right, to deployment of the AMF3 in the Southeast US. Um, the schematic on the right kind of summarizes um, our high level science drivers that we presented. So looking at not just land atmosphere interactions, aerosol and convective clouds, but also the ways in which they are coupled together, right, in time and in space and also giving some sense of the kind of measurement capabilities that we're going to need, right, in order to be able to make progress on these cross-cutting science drivers. So just to emphasize again that this is not only not a typical AMF deployment, it's not even a typical AMF3 deployment, right? So we have an expected five-year deployment from 2023 to 2028. And it's, it's worth mentioning that our, you know, that our science team proposal was funded in part because of land atmosphere interaction strengths. Right, so what that's basically saying is we are kind of expected, right, and kind of, and there's this great hope, right, that we can be able to make good scientific progress in looking at coupling between land atmosphere um, interactions with aerosol science drivers and convective cloud science drivers. Another theme that came up uh, in a number of the talks and discussion was the need for distributed measurement networks if we are going to be kind of making any progress in understanding right, impacts of multi-scale heterogeneity. We also talked a little bit about emergent 
near emerging measurement opportunities and that the Southeast could be a platform for deploying and investigating that. And also that our site science team, we, we are ambassadors for the site, right? We are ad advocates and attractors for the science that can be done. We are not gatekeepers for the science. So in other words, what I'm trying to say is that this site and the science that goes with it is our site as a community, right? And that the more we all invest, the more we are all gonna be getting out of it. So, uh, so unsurprisingly, right, citing and instrument prioritization of the AMF3 will be informed by community feedback. And welcome that feedback, uh, you know, so you can send emails to our SUS team at arm.gov list. So in terms of challenges, issues, and needs, right, and this also encompasses future plans, right, because we have a March 2023 site operational target that basically dictates backwards when we need to identify the site and when we need the site shortlist. And informing the site shortlist will be, and this is a need, and, a, and an ongoing activity are these science traceability matrices, right? Connecting science drivers to the required measurements, then to the required instruments, and then hopefully to a prioritized list of what those instruments are so we can present that to R. You know, uh, challenges, issues, and needs continuing are also the generation of these siting maps, right? So we're working with Sandia to generate map layers that are relevant for siting. So in this case, this is a map layer of column NO2 to give us a sense of regional pollution sources and distribution. You know, so in particular, when we're looking at the aerosol, when we're looking at the science drivers related to aerosol property and process controls in CCN, those naturally led to a number of science-driven siting needs and challenges. So two, two big themes came up. One is that we need to be able to tackle ob relevant observational scales, both spatially and temporally. We need distributed measurements, we need vertical measurements. We also need flux measurements. And that in order to accommodate a lot of these advanced science questions, we wanna make use of IOPs. So, so the discussion about having a guest aerosol trailer, where you can make these advanced measurements of composition, uptake, precursors, and removal. And then we also wanna integrate and coordinate these, IO, these routine IOPs with deployments of these vertical aerial assets. So just shown here on the upper, upper two panels are just the plots of NPF and SGP on, on the right, you see new particle formation happening at 17 UTC at the surface. But on the left, we see that there is a large um, a formation of a large number of nanoparticles elevated prior to observations at the surface, really pointing to the need for having um, coupled surface with vertical measurements. And with that, uh, I'm just gonna wrap up and just point you again that we have a web page and that we have an email list, not only for people who are interested, but also for our team, Southeast US team. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> Oh, thanks, Chungai. And so uh, now I'll introduce Chungai again for a uh, discussion on Tracer. All right. Okay. All right. So, um, so even though Tracer was not a, a breakout session during this PI meeting, we did have a workshop in April, bringing together uh, Tracer, uh, Tracer. Tracer PIs from the team, as well as those who are interested right, in participating and collaborating during this experiment. So I'll kind of try to be focus, focusing more on the aerosol aspects of this deployment. So just as an overview, uh, that you know we have a we have a campaign webpage. This tracer is taking place in the Houston, Texas region. It'll be deployed for a year, from April fifteenth, from twenty twenty one to twenty twenty two. There will be an intensive in the meantime from June first to September thirtieth, twenty twenty one, and the arm assets secured so far are the AMF-1, second generation scanning precip radar, and then this ancillary site with additional aerosol cloud and atmospheric state measurements. So get into a little bit about some of the aerosol process science themes that, uh, that, that Tracer is targeting are looking at you know, sources and sinks, contributing and controlling aerosol and CCN number budget. Uh, there's also a lot of interest in looking at ice nucleating particles, looking at potential you know, various emission sources and impacts of anthropogenic precursors on natural INP. And of course, since Tracer is, a, it is, is very much focused on convection, there are also a number of science questions looking at what are convective storm impacts, right? Pre and post storm and non-storm on urban aerosol processing, removal mechanisms for aerosol, and also vertical and horizontal aerosol transport mechanisms. Right, so with that being said, I wanted to just point out and remind everyone that you know, ARM has put out a call 
for tethered balloon flight proposals for the Tracer campaign in 2021. Um, so, uh, so I encourage you to go take a look at the call and to, um, and to submit, right? To, to submit because uh, a very important aspect about Tracer, as I mentioned earlier, are the spatial distribution of aerosol and relevant aerosol processes. We get into a little bit about uh, the uh, aerosol relevant assets that will be deployed. The AMF1 will be deployed for the entire campaign, right? And providing basic measurements of cloud, aerosol, atmospheric state, and precip. So in AMF1, um, and then I'll get in, into a little bit later uh, about the uh, aerosol payload for the AMF1. We're also going to be having a ancillary arm site, right? Ostensibly in a clean background environment. So this will be deployed during the June to September period in, in an unpolluted region. Um, the kind of core aerosol measurements that are, that are uh, secured for the ancillary sites so far are you know, measurements of CCN, uh, aerosol number, and aerosol size distribution. And these are all measurements coming from right, the initial tracer science proposal. There will also be measurements of atmospheric state and precipitation. So getting into a little bit about uh, more detail about you know, the relevant aerosol and aerosol precursor measurements, the AMM, AMF1 will have some gas phase chemistry, uh, aerosol number and size, chemical composition, water uptake, and optical properties as part of the baseline deployment. And as shown on the right is just an example of the kind of aerosol size range we are hoping to be able to target right, within, the, within the AMF1. And at the ancillary site, you know, we also look at water uptake and number and size distribution. So just to give you a map of kind of the spatial distribution of the various uh, fixed sites. So the AMF1 uh, is, will be sited in a polluted region at the Laporte Airport. So you kind of see that at the upper right. The ancillary site right, is to the southwest of Houston in clean air, right? And then uh, we will be having a uh, scanning precip radar situated right between the clean and the polluted site so that, we can, so that it will have sampling over both and can accomplish some convective cell tracking. And uh, also, uh, we very much want to be able to leverage, leverage existing and historical measurements uh, in the area. So to go over brief, what happens during the IOP is the ancillary site becomes operational. We have remote forecasting of convective days cell tracking from the scanning precip radar, various soundings, and then participation from a number of evolving intra and interagency um, collaborations. So just to give you a quick overview that, uh, you know, we have ex we're gonna leverage existing observational networks. So TCEQ, uh, Houston Precip Network, and also looking at distributed lightning in the area via the Houston Lightning Mapping Array. And then just also give you a sense that, you know, Without going into great detail, we have a number of um, potential inter and intra-agency collaborations. So this is to give you a sense that there are a number who, who want to participate, have submitted proposals to participate, and we hope to hear uh, about them soon. And with that, uh, I'm done. Thanks. Great. Thank you. <laughs> Um, for the really nice overview on both your session and the Tracer campaign. You have a couple of questions waiting for you in the chat and in the Q&A. So if you can attend to them, that would be great. And so now we are moving on to uh, the discussion portion of our session for the last about 15 minutes. <clears throat> and so the two, um, the two topics uh, we thought would be good to discuss with this group is, first of all, a follow-up on Alison McComiskey's presentation from Monday um, about the aerosol measurement science group um, activities and that uh, we are seeking community input. Um, and maybe in particular clarifying um, the discussion on the uh, IOP sampling mode, what, what this means. And um, this is sort of like opening up the the floor to um, something Jim and I want to follow up with uh, the aerosol processing working group um, as we move forward. So you can expect uh, some questions for us um, because we won't have the time now to go into great detail at all. And then maybe the, the last few minutes of the session we would like to devote to looking a little bit forward to the fall. Um, and talk about the topical virtual sessions that some of you might planning might be planning to organize. 
Um, and we just wanted to put this out there, who is planning one, um, what kind of format are you thinking of, and maybe brainstorm a little bit what elements we like uh, about these virtual meetings that have been working well um, in, in this meeting, for example, or other meetings that you have been um, attending. Um, so that, that we have a little brainstorm here of, to, to make these a, a success. And so with this, I move it over to Alison. Are you here? Um, I know you have a couple of slides to sort of like um, lead into the dis discussion about the AMSG uh, in initiatives. Right. There was one aspect of the presentation on the AMSG workshop that Nicole and Jim asked me to discuss a little bit further here um, so that we might get a little bit of feedback. We don't have a ton of time for discussion, um, but I did want to just provide a, a brief summary of the new sampling strategies that we're considering. Um, this was a, a shift from a continuous mode of operation, measuring everything everywhere all the time, to uh, an IOP mode of operation. And we're hearing a lot about this associated with the upcoming campaigns. But there's the potential to move to this kind of mode also at the armed fixed sites. So um, at this point, it's really just an idea. At the AMSG workshop, we discussed developing potentially a three-tier measurement strategy, which would involve a set of long-term observations that are similar to what we have now, but maybe pared down a bit. So understanding, you know, what are those core measurements that we really want to run over the long term? to provide context at a particular site for intensives. Then um, how would we manage these intensive periods? What would they look like? As part of this, we would bring in um, those more specialized arm instruments that were not run continuously, but also the idea is to really have a comprehensive set of measurements that we can really um, dig into the details of aerosol processes with. And this is really best done by providing space and infrastructure for guest instruments. So thinking about um, how we would make it easy to bring in guest instruments that would complement ARM instruments. Um, we also talked about considering uh, seasonal IOPs and that these would be um, potentially theme-driven, science-driven IOPs. So we would define particular themes and um, have a, a call for proposals for particular uh, IOP setups uh, that would be kind of campaign-like. Um, yeah, and so I, I guess that's all I wanted to say to start, um, if we had any particular maybe, feedback or questions. Maybe pause here and um, if people have a question right now to ask, you can raise your hand and we will unmute you so that you can ask a question or you can also keep typing questions into the chat window or the Q&A window. Anyone wants to ask a question by raising their hand? I don't see any questions. Right now, then maybe let's just move on. I think, Alison, you had a second slide sort of explaining about this matrix that we are going to work towards. Yeah, um, yeah, that's fine. So um, largely, I know it's difficult because we're not in a room to discuss, but we wanted to put this information forward because we'll, we'll definitely be asking for feedback on these things. Uh, another one is how we set up these capability needs templates that were presented in the plenary session on Tuesday afternoon in the ARM Decadal Vision session. So the idea with these is uh, to have something of an evolving and living document to track these needs rather than just having episodic workshops where we have recommendations that are set we'd have, have something living online. Um, and also that these would be really directed toward uh, the science priorities of the group and the program at the time. And so uh, just wanted to 
provide an overview of what these templates look like. Up top, you see they're, they're driven by science question. And what I have here are just the categories that Jim outlined for us early that are the predominant themes that the aerosol processes working group are working on. We'd like to devise some, um, some kind of canonical science questions around these themes that would drive us, uh, would drive the, the input into the categories that you see below. So for each of these science questions, we'd like to understand what are the problems and roadblocks that we have, largely in the measurements and the infrastructure in ARM in addressing those science questions, and what would be the impact of overcoming these problems and roadblocks. So how would that allow us to progress the science? What are the research elements of each of these for, um, for the measurement or infrastructure that we're recommending, what's the maturity or readiness? Is it something that's gonna really take a long time to develop or is it something with just a little bit of investment we can get up and running? Um, and just specifically, what is, what is the solution or the re recommendation specifically? And then how does that help us integrate observations with modeling. So really, um, you know, the mission of the ASR program is to improve um, climate model projections. And so how can we move those new measurement investments into the modeling space? So yeah, we'll, um, we'll definitely be putting out uh, a request for input on these. All right, thank you, Alison. And Dubay actually had a question. So Dubay, um, you are ready to talk here. Yeah, I, I had a quick question. If Alison, you could go back to the past slide, please. And I just wanted to add, I think this has been done at SGP and you probably already have it, uh, is in terms of IOPs and even long-term observations, where we locate like SGP or elsewhere in the future, there could be spatially extended connections to other sites. And so that may be useful uh, to include uh, at least the data sets because then we could address the issue of heterogeneities and also this extension, this um, distributed sensor uh, network would. Uh, so again, in short, uh, um, you know, is there linkages in these IOPs to neighboring sites or expanding the footprint of a particular arm site? Yeah, so you noted that SGP does have an, an extensive network already set up over that larger SGP domain. And so there's uh, certainly the consideration of, you know, taking that structure and implementing it at other sites. Um, but I guess, yeah, I'm not sure what you mean by linking to other networks. So networks that are external to ARM from like other agency networks that may be nearby. Yeah, so like for the South CS, uh, there is uh, a lot of, you know, we still don't know where we are, but it's expanded network, land atmosphere interactions obviously also happen at large scales. Right. So there may be potential synergies. Uh, uh, so yeah, I'm being a little proactive and seeing what else we could connect with or resources. So for example, if there was a site that had related information for land atmosphere information that was close enough, but not really owned by by arm, we could kind of at least somehow strategically link to them. I mean, get yeah. real estate, get science, yeah. Yeah, no, definitely noted. And that is something that came up in the workshop as well as making better use of existing uh, in measurement networks out there. So thanks for that comment. All right, any other one question? Susanna Boris had a comment that I will read out in the question and in, in the Q&A. Um, text box, just adding a comment that the approaches suggested here, adding vertical measurements and a combination of long-term measurements and coordinated IOPs seem to me to be good directions to move in for the purpose of improving models. So, and that's uh, a, a big motivation here. Okay, uh, thanks Alison for this overview and we will be uh, in contact with the aerosol processes working group in um, fleshing this out and, and filling out this uh, matrix template. 
And so for the last five minutes here, I just wanted to uh, ask everyone who is on here still um, who couldn't hold their um, session at this meeting because of the shortened schedule uh, and who want to um, organize a session later in the fall and what kind of format you were thinking like a, a two hour um, session just like to replace basically what what we couldn't do this time or maybe something longer so I open up the floor just raise your hand and I can give you permission to speak okay there's Joel 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 Thornton. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. Um, so I, I think a few of us were discussing having an SOA breakout type workshop um, later in the fall. And uh, nothing concrete has developed yet, but um, some emails will go out uh, through the various lists of the program. And so be look, on the lookout for that. And we'll probably first send out a scheduling link um, to a uh, poll to schedule, I should say. Um, so that's what will be coming in the next couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. Sounds great. And Susanna also. Yeah, so um, Nicole and I and Marcus uh, Pamir Walke had proposed a session on using advanced statistical approaches for constraining models with observations. So thinking about trying to collect ideas of approaches similar to those that Ken Carsla talked about this week or other approaches to do similar things. So that's, um, if there are folks in this breakout who might be interested in that, please let us know. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Anyone else with plans to hold a session? Jia Hong, yes. So we have uh, proposed uh, isonucleating particle sessions and uh, that, uh, yeah, looking at the uh, isonucleating particle properties and uh, the in different modes and uh, how that linked to the, the cost mode does. And uh, that can be, yeah, so we very interested in that, uh, that the breakout in the maybe in the fourth, fourth season. And then maybe also co considering the uh, uh, coordinating with the other working group because we have a uh, uh, second ice production the uh, uh, component in that uh, in that breakout uh, maybe this also relevant to the uh, to the high latitude uh, working group mm -hmm. thank you and Susanna maybe um, we should mention this also with um, our session on the statistical methods we were also thinking of coordinating with the machine learning session right and they also uh, yes Yes, exactly. So there were two machine learning sessions that had been proposed so that those three sessions together are now coordinating a small mini workshop. So, so issues related to machine learning that are different from what I had just described could also fit in as part of that. Mm -hmm. And Chi? Chi, you are ready. Okay. Um, I just want to mention that so we actually proposed to have a uh, a session on the aerosol chemistry uh, measurement uh, data from the DOE uh, users for facility. So that's including the ACSM and maybe some of the, the campaign data for, uh, for the AMS. So that was the, the plan of a session, um, probably in the fall or next year. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. All right, looks like this uh, PI meeting is to be continued in uh, a few months. And Jim, what do you think? I think we are close to our two hours and maybe we should adjourn the meeting now. Do you have any closing comments? <laughs> no, I mean, I, uh, I, I hope this can be the start of, uh, of maybe some, some great follow-up discussion. And um, yeah, we have uh, just a minute or two if anybody wants to uh, put in one last comment. Uh, but, uh, and, and then also uh, any kind of feedback, just sort of more generally related on the, uh, the, the format of the meeting, um, we're gonna um, gather our thoughts uh, about this. Uh, I think unfortunately this is going to be a fact of life uh, 
in the future. And so um, feedback about how we could have uh, improved matters, uh, what, what seemed to work well, what didn't uh, would be appreciated uh, from us all. Mm -hmm. So there's still a few questions popping up in the chat. So I would suggest we leave the session still going for these questions to be answered. But otherwise, I thank all the presenters again, especially the one minute madness presenters who kept their time um, to one minute. That was really great. Uh, and otherwise, yeah, thanks everyone and have a good weekend. Let's thank all the organizers and the folks at Orise and Oral for all their support. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, fantastic. Thank you.